<clears throat> hey friends, Hi. thank you for your patience and for hanging out with me today. Uh, my name is Scott Hanselman. You can go and uh, Google with Bing for Scott. Uh, I used to be the number one Scott because uh, I was the first. Uh, it doesn't, it's not a measure of importance, it's just a measure of who was really old on the internet. Uh, now I'm in an epic battle with Scott brand toilet tissue. So <laughs> I, you'll find me on the second page of Google. Uh, it's all good though. If you can uh, tweet and blog mean things about Scott toilet paper, as well as Scott bicycles and Scott fly rods, will bring me back to the first page where I belong. Um, I've got a podcast called Hansel Minutes. My last name is Hanselman, like Hansel and Gretel. And Hansel Minutes is like fresh air for uh, you know techies. It's basically fresh air or Science Friday. It's an NPR show that is not affiliated with NPR. Uh, I've also got another show called This Developer's Life, which is a total ripoff. <laughs> Nothing like you've ever seen before. Um, I've done over 700 episodes of Hansel Minutes, and I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, there's a lot of shows out there that are basically two white dudes on Skype talking about JavaScript, and they immediately become the top 10 you know, episodes on uh, iTunes, and I'm not bitter, but um, <laughs> I do have a lot of beautiful faces talking about a lot of beautiful technology going back over 700 episodes, and I've never had a problem finding lots of different people that talk about cool stuff, including this guy, who in 2014 talked to me about a bionic pancreas. That's five years ago. We'll talk about this gentleman in a little bit. Uh, when you do a talk about health and fitness, you're supposed to, supposed to show a picture of yourself doing something healthy and fit. I do not know who that guy is. He's a clip art. <laughs> that is a clip art man. Um, I cannot do that. All of my uh, physicality is usually Netflix related. Um, I did have a Netflix related injury recently where I fell asleep with the hot iPad on my face. <laughs> And, uh, and then I was on episode seven, and I know I was not on episode seven. I woke up around seven. I was reading episode three or watching episode three. And I had to figure out where I was. Not that guy. This is me. <laughs> I've been writing about diabetes, and I've been blogging for almost 20 years. Uh, I've been podcasting for 14 years. There's a lot of longevity here. This is October in 2012. Where I was blogging about hacking diabetes. Let's talk about the basics of type one diabetes. This is not type two diabetes. Everybody has a Nana who's got type two. We're gonna talk about the differences. Who are type one diabetics in the room here? Type one, type one. Any type twos in the room? Type two, okay, cool. So type twos and type ones, since we have some type ones here, interrupt and have a conversation with me. So if I describe something incorrectly or you feel that I'm not reflecting the differences between type one and type two, then tell me that, yeah, Scott, I don't think it's like that. I like to think about it like this. Is that cool? Because we've got a type one in the front as well. And by the way, when type ones meet, we have to clink pumps. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. The reason that I have Justin Timberlake there saying it's not like grandma's type two is that a lot of times people say, oh, I also have diabetes. And the thing is, it disrespects people with type one, type two diabetes to call it the same thing. It's different. So why don't we give these diseases different names? Because for most people who aren't diabetic, because you know the difference and you know the difference, they're like, oh, you got the sugars. You got the sugars. Do you need some orange juice? No, I do not need some orange juice. Are you supposed to eat that? No, I can eat whatever I want to. I'm grown. Those kind of conversations I do not like having with people. Now, here is a simple diabetes explanation. I want to understand, I want you to understand that there are lies that we tell children and there are lies that the diabetics tell the normally sugared people. Uh, this is not exactly how it, we all the normals. Uh, and the sugar people think about it like this. This is not technically medically true, but it's close enough. Food raises your blood sugar. You eat food, whether you eat steak or you eat sugar with a spoon, it turns into sugar. It raises your blood sugar. And if you take insulin, the intention of the insulin is to take that sugar and deliver it to your body. If you imagine that your veins are a hallway and there's all these doors, which are your cells, you enter the sugar into the hallway, it runs around, it's in the blood doing its thing, and it needs to have someone open the door so that it can exit the blood and enter your cells. Insulin opens the doors. Diabetics do not create, type one diabetics create no insulin. I have a non-working pancreas, so I have to externalize my insulin. I have to get it from elsewhere. If I don't, it will just sit there in the blood and hence high blood sugar. So you know those little honey bears that they have, little plastic honey bear that you put in your tea? You know how the top gets really nasty and gross after a couple of months and you have to like put it under hot water to get the gross honey around outside? 
Imagine if that were happening inside of your bloodstream. Diabetes, number one cause of blindness, amputation, liver, heart failure, all kinds of stuff break. Why would things break? And why, why do diabetics lose their feet? We have all heard that. Everybody's had a grandparent or somebody or someone who knows somebody who lost a foot or lost their eyesight. We never talk about why. Where are the tiny veins? Eyes, toes. What if they got clogged with that gross stuff that happens at the top of the honey bear? Then the body is, yeah, the body is going to start to basically protect this area and keep this part alive because this part's important and the other stuff is extra. And diabetics slowly get chopped up. We get chopped up from the toes all the way up and we keep this part alive. It's really quite awful. Um, now, injected insulin lowers blood sugar, helping it get delivered into the cells. But if you take too much, then you've removed all fuel from the fuel line and then the engine stops. So I like to express it in the terms of an airplane. This is an airplane analogy. I wrote this in 2004. So highs will kill you slow, lows will kill you quick, much like an airplane. With an airplane, if the altitude kind of goes higher and higher and higher and higher, you'll eventually float out into space and die slowly. If you are on an airplane and you're slowly going towards zero, eventually when you hit zero in an airplane, if you hit it at speed, you die quick. You want to hit zero, kind of like landing, but that actually makes the analogy break down. <laughs> so how do we control, how do we think about diabetes? If we put it in the context of an airplane, let's say that I want to fly from LA to New York and I want to have a nice smooth flight. That's what I want my blood sugar to look like. I want my blood sugar to be epic and smooth and I want it to just go like this as I fly. But you're flying this airplane and you're only allowed to look at the altimeter five times. You're only allowed to prick your blood, your, prick your fingers five times. Because who wants to prick their fingers 20 freaking times a day, right? I mean, you could. You could, right? You prick your finger probably a couple times a day, right? How many times you prick your finger? Four times. Hurts every time, doesn't it? I've been pricking my finger for 30 years. But does it still hurt? Yes. You think my fingers, like, <laughs> I'm going to punch you in the face once a day for 30 years. Yeah. No, it hurts every single time. So you do it four times a day because that's about as much as you can tolerate. You could do it every 10 minutes, 24 hours a day. But I got black marks and scarring on both sides of my fingers. You run out of stuff to, to, to poke. So you only look at your altimeter, your blood sugar, a couple times in that flight. And then when you pull the stick, you eat. And when you push the stick forward, you take a shot. Okay, but you're only allowed to do that two, three times a day too. So now enjoy your flight from LA to New York. That is, looks like this. Even worse, what if you only check your altitude at the beginning and the end, and then you just draw a line. You're like, that was an amazing flight. Completely missing the fact that you were doing this all day long. Then when things go wrong in 20 years and your blood sugar is a mess and you don't know why and you're having all these problems, you, all the graphs said that it was smooth because I drew a line. 9 a.m., blood sugar was amazing. 5 p.m., blood sugar was amazing. I don't know what the problem was. Here's what I have to do with my blood sugar. I have a continuous glucose meter. It's an implant. I'll show it to you in a little bit. And it looks at the interstitial fluid. We are just big bags of meat under pressure. We're about 70% water. And you want to get your blood sugar, you got to look at blood. But I can't walk around with a needle in my arm. That would be a little weird. So I've got an implant in my arm, which looks at the interstitial fluid. It is actually about that long. And it pokes into the juice of the giant meat bag. <laughs> I can then prick my fingers and look at my blood, which confirms that the, the number that it guessed from the interstitial fluid is about right, because I'm confirming it with the whole blood measurement. Then I count carbs, do math, think about insulin, do all kinds of stuff. I want to pause for a second here and talk about privilege. Think about the fact that we have invented a disease by which people who are good at math will live longer <laughs> than people who are not good at math. How unfair is that? This is one of the things we're trying to do to solve that. Then I listen to react, live, and I loop. This is called the loop. And this is what it looks like, and it sucks. The walk from the hotel for me was planned. I, ha I couldn't just, hey, we're going to walk. We're, oh, it's a half a mile. I had to plan that shit. Excuse my French. Here's your blood sugar normals. Uh, you eat whatever the hell you want. You go to sleep. It's amazing. And you wake up, and then you eat again. <laughs> 
See, she's shaking her head because we hate you all. <laughs> now, this is the other thing that's fun about this. As we think about diabetes is that really it's a, an invisible disability. And when you think about kind of the intersectionality of all of our identities, you say, hey, look, you know, straight, witch, white guy, invisible disability. My privilege, of course, is I don't have to tell you all about it. But I've got implant here. I've got medical device here. He puts all these cords on me for microphones, thereby interfering with the important cord, which is my insulin pump, which is now tangled in these cords. I woke up this morning to try to pee at around 3 in the morning, and the pump was like this, because <laughs> i got to keep it in my drawers. And, uh, and then uh, it's in an unfamiliar hotel room, so I go, oh, I'm going to go to the bathroom, and I go around, and it pulls on the doorknob, and it rips out of, oh, it's just good times, diabetes. <laughs> this here is called the loop. Now, to loop like that, I have to close that loop. I have to look at my blood sugar. I have to think about my blood sugar. I've got to do math. And then I have to make a decision, and then the loop continues. Diabetics have to do this all the time. This sucks. Sucks bad. Looping is read and write. Now we're going into software engineering. Read, what's my sugar? Write, take some insulin or take some food. Here's how it usually looks. You poke, you're a poke a hole. There's a little piece of gauze there. It sucks in the blood, checks your blood sugar, and then you'd have a needle and then you jab it into the meat bag and you take this insulin. Uh, before disposable needles, you would have a big old like heroin looking needle in like a leather case that you would boil every day and then you would, your grandma had one of those. It sucks. Um, actually, I was, funny story, I was ejected from a, uh, a casino in, uh, in Vegas for checking my blood sugar at the craps table. Apparently there is a no bodily fluids rule what kind of casino has a rule? What happened at this casino <laughs> that they had to make that rule? I was like, I was ready to burn it all down. I was like, ADA, Americans with Disability Act. Like, who, who hurt you? Who hurt, who hurt you, craps table man, that you had to eject my little drop of blood? What, who came in with like an artery spurting onto the craps table? Because you had to kick my ass out of the casino. So that sucks. Now, every diabetic engineer ever always gets the disease, has a day where they feel horrible and they think that they're dying and this is the worst thing that ever happened to them, and then they say, all right, this is the first time anyone's ever been diagnosed with diabetes, so therefore, I will solve this with Microsoft Excel. <laughs> How long have you been diabetic? Uh, 34. 34 years? Yeah. Were you an adult or you were a little no, kid? I was three. Okay, so you didn't go and get, you, you were three, you didn't open up uh, Excel. Okay. So I was 19. I was 19 and I opened up Excel. I tried to write software. Everyone I've ever met who was diagnosed as diabetic in their adulthood immediately says, all right, this is a math problem. I know this. And then they try to solve it. Um, so I tried to solve this in the 90s and I made Glucopilot with the Palm Pilot. I had 4K of memory. And, uh, and then I got color, which was nice. It was uh, the first application on a Palm Pilot that could draw a circle because Palm Pilots didn't have a math library. If you ever want to talk about geeking out on what you can do in 4K of RAM, holler at me. <laughs> I had charts and graphs, all this kind of stuff. I was selling this for $19.95 on CompuServe in the 90s. Living the dream. And then I would hook it up to a little cell phone thing. Remember these where you could have like a cell phone that you would plug on the back of the Palm Pilot and then I would send it up to the cloud it wasn't called the cloud at the time. The cloud is a fancy word that hipsters use to mean another person's computer. <laughs> so I would FTP this up into, you know, some comma separated values into a cloud somewhere. And I would want to take these blood sugar meters and I would want my data because it's my data. My body produced it. So we get these blood sugar meters and we plug them in to uh, the computer and we want to dump stuff from them. And there's a couple things that are wrong with that. First, none of these have standard ports. USB didn't exist, so you had serial ports. They had little headphone jacks. So you'd go from headphone jack to funky serial port, and then you'd have to figure out the format. And you would call the company and you'd say, hey, I'm a nerd. I would like, <laughs> I would like your, data, your data sheet so that I might have my data that my body produced. Oh no, that's proprietary, sir. It's a proprietary magic special sauce. But if you download our special software, we will let you get the freestyle or the one touch or whatever. There's a whole ecosystem of these things. 
each of which has basically DRM, digital rights management, for my blood. So we started breaking into them. So this is me breaking into a glucose meter in 2007 because it's my data. People started doing this. This was me in 2007. Now, the internet wasn't super social back in the day, right? There wasn't Git, there wasn't, there was CompuServe, there was the beginnings of this, but how would I discover this? I mean, I was basically, if Google couldn't find it, I didn't know that I was doing this work at the same time that other people were doing this work. So I wanna make sure that I'm not gonna take, I'm not taking credit for any of this that has happened in the community and the solution that they've ultimately come up with. I'm simply a member of an enthusiastic group of people that did what any engineer would do, which is try to solve it until we found each other and then put the pieces together. All the while, people with PhDs who know how to use PDF uh, <laughs> would go and make similar systems. While I was building what I thought was the first and most innovative thing, other people were doing the exact same thing. Again, not to pat me on the back, but to simply acknowledge that when the light bulb is needed, the light bulb gets invented multiple times by multiple people around the world. So people are figuring out how do you get data onto these tiny computers as Palm Pilots start to happen. People who aren't technical start building these MacGyver systems. I'm gonna send a text message to if this then that with a number that will then put it into a spreadsheet and then it knocks the, the bowling ball down that hits the iron and then makes the toast and, you know, and then repeat from step one. They don't even know it, but they're looping, right? They're coming up with ways to manage their blood sugar in the only way that they know how. Everyone, every time, always. So we talked about needles. You said your grandmother had the big kind of like heroin needle thing. Um, great, great way to, uh, to get the attention of everyone at the table is just to pull out a needle. <laughs> and, and diabetics who were like, like militant diabetics, like we were yeah, we're like, okay, everybody, let's get going. Bam, you like that? Ah. Like, you know, like, I remember when I was like early on and back in the day, I was like, God damn right, I'm diabetic. Pow, you like that? You know, because I was mad in Vegas, right? I mean, this is the thing though. You're learning about these subcultures. And this is so fun about the intersectionality of all of this is that there's all these little subgroups of people and the intersections of them. Uh, and, this, and I'm talking about diabetes. We could be talking about CPAP machines. We could be talking about blood pressure. You know, anything where there's a medical problem that involves constant feedback and a machine and big pharma that then doesn't allow you access to your data. So apply everything we're talking about to things that aren't necessarily diabetic. So needles suck. Poking the meat bag is no fun. Maybe some kind of pump. DIY. Here is the first insulin pump. Yeah. Imagine hating needles so much that you're going to wear a backpack. <laughs> For real. That is the first. Here is another one. I'm going to zoom in on this. This is a genius device. This was created by an Italian gentleman and carved out of wood. No 3D printers. Carved it out of wood. Here's the syringe plunger. There's the syringe. This screw turns. Now, when you turn a screw and you tighten it, what does it do? It goes that way. Very slowly. Who said that? Exactly. So then it's pulling this piece of metal, and each revolution moves it a half a millimeter, thereby slowly and reliably sending the insulin into the body. This is a 17-year-old insulin pump that I bought on Craigslist for $600. Greatest country in the world, and I bought this on Craigslist. It is cracked, it has got been glued, super glued, re glued, and it's the only one that I have. Finger sticks. Finger sticks suck, right? Four times a day sucks. Maybe we can measure more often. People come up with what they call non invasive systems. The idea is I don't want to poke the meat bag, it hurts. Maybe we could come up with a way to know what's happening inside without actually poking it, because it leaks when you do it. Uh, they made a thing called a Gluco watch. And the Gluco watch was a cool watch. You see how cool that is. All the kids love the, the new hip watch with two metal pads. And the metal pads would sit on your skin and it would look at the uh, electrical resistance across the two pads and try to glean your blood sugar by looking at the sweat and fluids that are naturally there on the skin, figuring out the resistance across, not the interstitial fluid, but the surface tension of the skin on top of the interstitial fluid. 
Remember how I said electrical resistance? It has to shock you and send electricity through here. So it was a great product. It told you your blood sugar every 15 minutes, but the electrical burns were problematic. So I called them and I said, love the product, big fan, love it. Um, the burns. <laughs> they, they literally said, well, you want to rotate it in and out from the inside and the outside of each wrist, allowing the other wrists to heal from the, <laughs> from the skin irritation. They are no longer in business. <laughs> the fact is, if you want to know what's going on inside the bag, you have to poke it. So we poke it. This is a Dexcom. You can pass that around. Ron. That is the sensor inserter that I put in my arm. There's a needle in there. You won't, it won't hurt you, I promise. And you poke it into your body. Here's a pump. That's a non-working pump. You poke it into the body, and it looks like this. It's a bendy, doesn't hurt. Well, it hurts when it goes in, but once it's in, it's cool. Okay. And then there's a battery. Battery lasts for 111 days, and the sensor lasts for about seven days, which is not very long. And your sensor, you said, lasted for five or six? It's supposed to last seven, but... Yeah, yeah, it doesn't really. Five yeah, and it's like 60 bucks a pop every time you do it. So we've got firmware uh, hacking that we can go and reset the timers. So it looks like that on the body. And uh, the general idea of an insulin pump, this is the reed. This is the right. The tube pokes into a plastic cannula. Cannula is a fun way to just say plastic needle that goes into your body and it squirts the insulin into your fat. And the fat then has to absorb the insulin. You don't have any fat. Who, me? Yeah. I'm sucking it in. <laughs> when, you, when you get in towards 50, you'll learn to suck it in too. <laughs> Remember I said meat bags under pressure. <clears throat> I'm on stage, brother. You know, I'll let it, I'll let it out later. Um, the body's fat is not meant to absorb insulin. Your insulin, the normals, it comes into the, you know, the peritoneum and it's inside the body. So you absorb it because it's already in the bag. We're having to forcibly shove it into little bubbles in the fat and then the fat absorbs it, which means it takes time. I can take a shot right now. It'll be at least a half an hour before anything happens, probably an hour. Fair? Okay, so you're on an airplane flying from New York to LA and you look at your blood sugar, your altitude. By the way, when you check your blood sugar, you're actually looking at the past. Everyone thinks it's their blood sugar right now. It's not. It was their blood sugar five, 10 minutes ago. Now I'm going to make an adjustment. Pull up, pull up, push forward, push forward, right? We've all had that pull up, pull up moment, right? Poke yourself with the insulin, wait for 30 minutes. So you're flying from New York to LA. Look at the altitude. That was 10 minutes ago. Pull back on the stick. Nothing will happen for half an hour. It's like driving the Mars rover, right? You go, oh, go left. Wait nine minutes for the speed of light. So you actually have a controlled loop system with delay. Very, very challenging. Now, if you're a supermodel who does not have diabetes, it looks like this. And you were hired. If you are not a supermodel who does not, who was not hired for this gig, and these were not taped on, and actually you were punctured, in fact, you would see a row of holes and bruises all the way around as we have to rotate these punctures because once you've used that fat up, it's not good for a while. So you're always searching for stuff, places to put this. How often do you rotate? Every three days, every five to seven days. So right now, I've got the reed up here and the right, right there. <laughs> and it would be totally appropriate and completely not a problem if I, who just met my new diabetic friend here, if I was like, where do you put your pump? Where are you, oh, where are you doing yours? Uh, so she's right here. here yeah. My sensor is, is down on the leg. Here. See, if I could put it in my leg, I would love to do that. So we would actually compare notes. I'm not supposed to. You're not supposed to put it down there? No, but I- Don't listen to your doctor. No. Is your doctor diabetic? No, he's then not. Then he has nothing he can say to me. <laughs> I do not trust a diabetic doctor who is not diabetic. You know what I mean? Yeah. For real. Like, 
I've been diabetic for, for over 25 years, and every single year for 25 years, they have told me that it will be cured in five years. <laughs> Same? Every year. Five more years, we got you. So we're not going to wait. We're done, and we're not waiting anymore. We're going to plug in as many sensors as possible as we can to get as much information <laughs> as we possibly can. Now, I want to pull this data. I want to get a hold of my data. I want to store it somewhere. I want to put it somewhere. I wrote this in 2001, 18 years ago. Bluetooth was just coming out. The pump might use my cell phone to call its data into a central server, the cloud. <laughs> if I wander near my home computer, this is Wi-Fi was just starting, Bluetooth's 30 meter range, we were so young, <laughs> 30 meters, my AirPods can't sink and it's near my ass, right? I mean, if you get that much range out of Bluetooth, it's a miracle. Uh, 30 meter range could provide the doctor with minute by minute medical history. The idea was I would be wandering around my house and it would notice I was near the computer and it would jump into the computer. That's how we thought it would work. This is 18 years ago. My wife and I traveled all over the world and we would have to manage my blood sugar with a Palm Pilot and a little laptop because we got to keep me alive as we travel from time zone to time zone. Oh, oh, let's go off for keeping Scott alive. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you. <laughs> so our hashtag is we are not waiting. So the DIY community started by a lot of different people started to discover each other online, discover in social environments that we existed, find forums, Facebook groups, Twitter, hashtags. It was an organizing facility for people to go and say, you know, I don't have an answer, but I do have a function. So think about the functions. The functions are, hey, um, this is the thing that they gave me when I got diagnosed, and it's proprietary and weird. But if I plug a USB cable in and I figured out the protocol, I can dump the data from here. That's a person who had that idea. Someone else said, well, you know, if I got a Raspberry Pi and a USB and I write a for loop, I could just say, what's my blood sugar? What's my blood sugar? What's my blood sugar? What's my blood sugar? In a loop. And then once it's on here, we could send it to the cloud. They started to build a thing called Night Scout. Night Scout allows you to manage your blood sugar and do what's called remote viewing of your blood sugar. So if we go and bring up the browser here, assuming I have, you're going to see my crappy blood sugar, and we'll talk about why it's crappy right now. This is my blood sugar, actual live feed. Lost the, uh, Did I lost the feed? Yeah. Lost the nice feed? You like that? <laughs> Duplicate. Do I have interwebs? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Pause for effect. That's not the effect I was looking for. Okay, so my blood sugar kind of sucks right now. Why? Why do you think I would have amazing blood sugar for the last day and a half? What, what in the world, other than this taco, uh, <laughs> would have caused that spike? Stress, the presentation. Yeah, the walk was the walk was that, the low. That was me walking. This is me anticipating talking to y'all. And then this is a prediction line of the future. Well, you're doing great. So. Well, you're very kind. I, I appreciate that's very kind. So we are not waiting. Night Scout is remote viewing. Imagine if you've got a child, any queen who has a child of diet with diabetes? You got a kid with diabetes? Have they ever been on a, uh, an overnight camp? Would you be comfortable putting them on an overnight camp? Exactly. You would want to see their blood sugar. You would want to know remotely that they're OK. You would want it on your watch. You would want it on glanceable displays. We, can, we now can take an, a cheap Android device, put Chrome on it, make it full screen, and have a picture frame of your blood sugar on the wall, hanging on the wall. There's little Johnny's blood sugar. Um, in fact, you can go and get, I've got all these things for you to see. This is a pie portal. You can get these from Adafruit, tiny picture frame with your blood sugar on it, written in Python. I've got that on my blog. Also, another thing just to point out, uh, my friend here and I both have Medtronic pumps that have tubing. These are all used insulin pumps. Just take two of them. These are pumps. That's literally an insulin pump that would go like this. So you'd have the reed 
and the right. So pumps are getting smaller. That backpack is now that. But the companies are all proprietary. They don't want us to talk to their thing, so we keep hacking into them. We hack into them in any way that we can. The community goes and looks at um, the, the, the traffic on the wire, they listen to Bluetooth, they, they anti-DRM them, they write little tools to try to talk to these devices. Once you get your data though, I have a REST API for my own body. I can do it just to get and tell you what my blood sugar is. So what can I do now? Now that I can do that, well, I could stick it in my Git prompt. That's my blood sugar in my prompt while I'm coding. I've got a keyboard with lighted keys that turns red if my blood sugar goes bad. So if I'm focused on coding and my keyboard is flashing red, I can deal with it. All of this starts with me getting my own data, which I had to wrest, no pun intended, from the hands of the uh, DRM people that suck. Here's my wife saying, hey, your blood sugar is trending down. I was in Germany. She texted me from the US saying, I notice your blood sugar is going down. And we've gone since and hooked up Alexa, what's my blood sugar, and Siri to make shortcuts to go and tell you what your blood sugar is. Here's what I what's my blood sugar? It runs a shortcut, which just goes and makes a rest call. Your shortcut says, your blood sugar is 227 right now. Isn't that cool? It'll go down, don't worry. I know, I know what I'm doing. Uh, you can, it's bad blood sugar, but trust me, it's okay. Um, this is blood sugar on a Pebble watch. Now, if I can read my sugar values, I've got 13 minutes, how can I dose insulin automatically? The read, here's the write. Now the pump only writes, the pump does not know my blood sugar. Now this young lady has a integrated system where her pump has both the data on it and uh, the, the read and the write integrated into one thing. And it's kind of got like Tesla autopilot, right? It'll, yeah. It's not sophisticated, but it'll keep you in the lines, right? If you fell asleep with your blood sugar at 200, would it bring you down? Uh, it would try. It's not very... You don't sound super confident. Back. No, because um, I have so many alarms set because I'm more of a... I It'd be beeping you and warning you all the yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to be able to deliver insulin. There's two ways to deliver insulin. One is called a bolus. If you've ever gone to the hospital when you were dehydrated, they might say, we're going to give you a bolus of saline. A bolus is just an infusion of liquid. Uh, we use the term bolus to indicate uh, an infusion of insulin. And then basal, which is the background uh, insulin. If you think about driving a car and you're trying to stay behind, in between the lanes, you doing this subconsciously to stay in the lanes, moving the steering wheel, that's basal background insulin. Just background stuff to keep me going. And then, oh, we're going to make a left turn. That's a bolus. I'm going to have a taco. Big right turn. What's blocking us? Closed ecosystem, no open standards. There's in fact a Bluetooth standard for pumps and CGMs, but no one actually uses it. You know how your computer goes and says, hey, it's a headphones, or your car says, oh, Bluetooth, I know this, wanna sync your contacts? Wouldn't it be great if I had a Bluetooth profile that said, hey, I'm an insulin pump, you want your blood sugar, are we good? Da -da -da -da. They don't use that, it exists, but it's not used because they want proprietary things. Very few pumps allow remote access, and this is a challenge. So some folks got together and broke into the pump. This is a pump that I got on Craigslist with firmware 2.4a and below. The newer versions of the firmware, the new version of that pump does not have this problem, this, this, this ability to be talked to remotely. What they did is they did something amazing that is called software-defined radio. This is a radio. You can get them for 20 bucks on the Amazon. And um, I want to be at, what is a radio station in Atlanta? 103, 103.3. 103.3. Okay, that's proof that this is a radio. I'm going to go to 916.55. Now I'm going to talk to my pump. I'm getting the history from my pump right now. They, they, they decoded that. 
the ones and zeros are flying across the wire right now at 915. This is called the sub gigahertz range. This is called SDR, Software Defined Radio. This is a great way to get kids excited about STEM because you can go and grab the radio right off of the air. If you want to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, remember us learning about that? And we were all, remember they showed you the big long thing? Gamma radiation, you become the Hulk. Uh, here's the visible light spectrum. Like it was all very abstract. I didn't get any of it until like a couple months ago when I started getting involved in software defined radio and I can go and literally see bits flying across the actual wire. So they went and they decoded the communication. Now, my phone doesn't speak 915 megahertz. That's weird. What a weird thing. That's where your garage door opener is. So they went and created a 915 megahertz to Bluetooth bridge. So my pancreas is this device. There's my blood sugar talking to Bluetooth, talking to the old pump. Bluetooth didn't exist when this pump was made. So we're talking to it that way. That's called a Riley link. This is not a computer. It's a microcontroller. So what it's doing right now is it's actually giving me suggested amounts of insulin in order to keep me vertical. Isn't that cool? The thing I want you all to understand is when you're a programmer and you go and you learn about something like this, you should have, there's usually two, two feelings. One is a feeling of being completely overwhelmed. And the second one is a sense of just in the innate power that you have to go and make something like this to influence this. This isn't rocket science. It's Python. It's Node. Like, we know this stuff. It's all just for loops and data. It's ones and zeros. It's just ones and zeros flying across the electromagnetic spectrum. But once you get past that, the community started getting together and coming up with solutions. Because once I have a read and I have a write, maybe I can start doing these things. I can store the data in Apple Health Kit. I can put it in Night Scout for remote access. We can then start sharing open source libraries <laughs> to talk to these different things. One person says, all right, I'll talk to this pump. Another person says, all right, I'll figure out how to get data from this blood sugar system. So our potential future is a spectrum of smart pumps. Step one would be a first generation artificial pancreas would be a pump that turns off if your sugar is really low. This is effectively called a dead man switch. It'd be a car that pulls over if you let go of the wheel. So imagine the person is on the ground, unconscious, and basically almost dead, and the pump's like, huh, I'll turn off just to be safe. That would be step one. That is not a very sophisticated pancreas, but it can be a big deal. If you have hypoglycemic, hypo, low, glycemic, sugar, low sugar, unawareness, it would be very helpful for the pump to turn off and stop pumping you full of, of, of insulin if you're unconscious. What we have right now is what's called an automated hybrid closed loop. My blood sugar is high right now. If I do nothing, it'll come down in about an hour automatically. It is noticing that I'm drifting out of the lane and it's going to not jerk the wheel back because then I would oscillate. It's going to slowly bring me back into the lane. But if I wanted to go and dose myself and say I'm going to have some tacos or something, then I would be uh, a hybrid. I would have to actually warn it. I warned it I was walking this morning. I had to, I had to go onto my phone and say, I'm going to go for a walk. The, the godmother of uh, open source artificial pancreas, his name is Dana Lewis. If you're interested in the space, Dana Lewis kind of invented the space by pulling all of these things together. And she built the first open source artificial pancreas by taking a Raspberry Pi, a big battery, US, USB to the, um, the proprietary sensor device, and then a USB thing that would let her talk 915 megahertz. She put that all together. Here's her tweeting about it in 2015 when this whole thing started. Then other people said, well, shoot, you know, Raspberry Pi, that's kind of big. Battery, that's kind of big. That's just Bluetooth. That's 915 megahertz. Why don't we make one with a Raspberry Pi Zero in a 3D printed case with a tiny hat on top? And that's now an artificial pancreas. So she had the fanny pack and carried it around and pioneered for us. And now we have smaller ones. We, in fact, have competing open source artificial pancreas. You have your choice in artificial pancreas. There's in fact four different kinds, possibly five different artificial pancreases you can look at. There's one on the Intel Edison. This gentleman here created the Riley link, which is the Bluetooth bridge. 
I put a, I super glued a tile on it. That way I can, if, if I lose it, right? He did that in 2015. He said, maybe someday it will look like this. I started looping in 2016, less than a year after he tweeted that, and I've been on a, on a closed, closed loop, meaning a system that loops for me for over three years. This is the decoding of the ones and zeros off of the, the space. Here's some Python code that's pulling those packets out of the space. You have to figure out the width. There's all kinds of stuff. There's a whole article about learning about how to suck data off of the, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. That is a view of what my phone application looks like. Not mine, but the one I run. Um, there's my blood sugar. There's a prediction line. Here's active insulin. So I have to think about uh, the word we use is decay. If you eat something like a taco, it slowly leaves your body. It leaves your body at a different speed than an apple or some candy or a steak. So I'm constantly thinking about the decay rate of insulin and the decay rate of, of carbohydrates. Again, popping off the stack to the very beginning of the talk, it's totally unfair that people who are good at math live longer than people who aren't. So this democratizes that. Every single thing that I have shown you, every single thing that I am showing you, is free and open source. The only barrier is finding an insulin pump on Craigslist. So the community has gotten together and a company called, a nonprofit called Tidepool has, uh, is partnering with, with Insulet, which uh, made these little, these guys here. And we're gonna have a, a, an actual warranty supported insulin pump that insurance would pay for, uh, probably within the next year or so. When I go and tell it about my blood sugar and about what food I'm gonna eat, I actually tell it with emoji. So I say, I'm gonna have candy, tacos, or pizza, two hours, three hours, or four hours, and we have a whole selection of emoji, fruits, and whatnot, and that's why that taco showed up in the, uh, in the Night Scout. I can now check my blood sugar from my watch, and I can go and dose it. and then just say bolus. And then if I did it with my, with, my, with my phone, it would do face ID or touch ID to keep you from killing me. <laughs> if you wanna know about all the math, we have all the math. The important thing about putting together a system like this is transparency. It's absolutely essential that we be transparent because if you're gonna put a child on something like this, you've gotta know the math. You wanna have your choice in pancreases and your choice in algorithms. On the open APS side, the open artificial pancreas system side, Dana and friends have multiple algorithms for you to choose from. Everyone's body's different. So what's the goal, my friends? The goal is to die of old age. The fact is today, diabetics die of diabetes, period. I will either get hit by a truck or I will die of diabetes. I will not die of old age. Um, I currently am hoping to die uh, in some kind of an ice cream truck related accident. I just think that the irony of like me just like covered in ice cream, like, ah, he went the way he loved, you know, that would be really cool. Um, this is me giving a talk. It hurts. Does it not hurt? Yeah, I talked to you this morning and my blood sugar jumped up 30 points. Just really? Being just excited from talking. Right. Think about that. There are like 44 or 45 different things that people have identified as reasons your blood sugar goes up. Stress just being one of them. Just being enthusiastic and having a great conversation. Your body dumps sugar into your brain so that you can have that great conversation. And because we had a great conversation, she pays the price. And the tough part is that neither of us know if this is working until it's too late. I'll talk to you in 20 years and we'll see if keeping good blood sugar kept us alive. That's the thing that sucks. You have a child who's diabetic and you say, keep your blood sugar good. It's really, really important. You gotta make sure your blood sugar is really, really good. Why? Well, trust me, in, in 30 years, you'll, you'll thank me. There's no, there's no immediate gratification for knowing whether or not this is a good thing. It's very, very troublesome. If anyone here is getting blood work regularly, you go to your doctor, you go and get a, get a blood panel, ask them to check your hemoglobin A1C. It is the long-term measure of your blood sugar. Everyone should do this at least once a year. You want to have a number between four and six. That is kind of, this is an oversimplification. It is the percentage of red blood cells coated in sugar. How much sugar is kind of like coated on the walls of your, of your body. If it's in seven, uh, if it's over 10, you are going to be ill soon. Um, diabetic somewhere range in this area. The higher this number, the more you are effectively marinating in your own blood sugar. 
you can smell diabetics breath. We, you have so much sugar in your system, you pee it out, it seeps out of your, your skin, it's on your tongue. I know my blood sugar is high right now because I can taste it. You know what I'm talking about? I'm looking for her for, um, for validation. <laughs> that is my hemoglobin A1C. Square in the normal range, it's between five and six, and I absolutely say it's because of the open source artificial pancreas system. The way forward, recognizing that my data is a right, I wrote about the, sh the horrible, horrible state of diabetes technology in 2012. This gentleman here said, you know, someone should do something. Has anyone tried this? So he actually did something. Quit his job, started a nonprofit, made Tide Pool, and created a device uploader. Remember how I had a device uploader for this device and one for that device? He created the universal device uploader to go and plug in your blood sugar meters. You should all check this out, the Tide Pool uploader. All, uh, and then now he took this open source project, Pancreas project, and he is sponsoring it, hired the lead developers out of the community full time to work on this, and they're working to put it in the iOS app store. This is not in the app store. You have to build this yourself. Now, speaking to privilege very, very briefly, and I'm already two minutes over, we have parties where we get people together and teach them how to do this because it's not fair that we make this only for techies. So you can get together. The first step is setting up Night Scout for your, for your remote viewing. You can find someone, put together a get together of five or 10 or 15 diabetics and a techie. You load up Azure or Heroku. You teach them how to do these things. You walk it through step by step so that they can go and see their blood sugar. And then you slowly get and collect the pieces and the parts that you need to assemble your own pancreas. Okay, the Night Scout Foundation, you can go and donate money to or help them. Uh, open APS, you can see the reference design for Dana's original pancreas and how they run that project. Dana Lewis, Dana M. Lewis. Okay, this is a little boy going to school on the first day of school with his pancreas. Um, when I, well, that last thing, when I went and uh, made my Xbox avatar, there was no way for me to express my cybernetic aspects, so I put an arm on, and that wasn't like really awesome because I, I wanted to look like me because representation matters. So I worked with Console Kings and we made a diabetic accessory that you can buy for three bucks in um, Xbox and it will um, support, there's me, it'll support uh, diabetes uh, research and all the money goes to the uh, Night Scout Foundation. Those are the hashtags to check out. We are not waiting and open APS. Thank you very much.